Ninth Story Studios, giving story a voice. This is Addison Peacock, and you're listening to The Wicked Library. Warning. The Wicked Library is a horror fiction podcast created for a mature audience. Our stories contain graphic descriptions of pain, murder, violence, blood, betrayal, and inhumanity. Monsters win, people die, and hope is often shattered. There is also beauty, heart, catharsis, and raw emotion. Fear may be deeply personal, but we all share it. If at any time a story takes you to a place too dark, turn on the lights, press pause, or press stop. And always remember that unlike in the real world, these nightmares and your participation in them are under your control. Hello. Welcome to Season 11 of the Wicked Library. This is Daniel Foytek, and it's good to be back introducing today's episode. I hope you've been enjoying the season so far and that you've enjoyed our guest hosts. We have many more guest hosts over the next several episodes as we jump into bringing you more fresh Wicked Tales next week. Most of May has been focused on catching up on production of the Wicked Library and getting ready to launch Season 5 of Victoria's Lift. Speaking of Victoria's Lift, today's episode is a special presentation of the first mini-series we created for Victoria's Lift, and tells the tale of Victoria facing down an ancient foe and trying to overcome his wicked plan. It originally aired as a three-part adventure, but for your enjoyment and convenience, I have combined the full story into a single episode. If you enjoyed today's tale, check out more of Victoria's Adventures, Subscribe to Victoria's Lift and Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Part Twilight Zone, but wholly unique, the show is an award-nominated audio drama with an average rating of 4.7 out of 5 stars on Apple Podcasts. Most of our 77 episodes follow visitors as they meet the mysterious guide and are prompted to make a choice. Others reveal secrets about the building, Victoria, and her music box. Christopher Long, the author of our last episode here on the Wicked Library, has written several episodes of Victoria's Lift, including an epic 10-part miniseries. Five parts are currently available to listen to right now. Today's story is told by Graham Rowett, accompanied by a custom score by Nico Viteze of We Talk of Dreams. Full cast notes are at the end of this episode and in the show notes for today's story. Now, without further ado, let's take a dark ride on Victoria's Lift. Let's go for a ride. My name's Victoria. I have lost so much. My name's Victoria. I am bound to this place. Charged with guiding those who must choose. Don't be afraid. I can never again be the little girl I was. Will you accept your fate? Or change it? I have my music box. And a library lost. But I sometimes feel very alone. Won't you join me? It's time for your ride on the lift. <laughs> Don't be afraid. The woman was back again. Victoria tapped her foot and frowned. As with the last time the stranger had appeared, standing outside her building, Victoria felt an odd familiarity, as if she should know who this woman was. As she often did, she spoke to her music box. I'm certain I haven't met her before. Well, yes, we have seen her once before, but we haven't met her. We only meet those who are supposed to be here. 
she's, well, it seems she's found us. And that shouldn't be possible now, should it? Victoria found herself cross and confused. She loved a good mystery, and surprises almost always delighted her. But this was different. It was, well, it was unnatural. Nothing was really what one might call natural when it came to her building, or her music box, or her lift, or, well, herself, really, if she was being honest. But this, well, this was more unnatural than normal. She giggled a bit, despite her frustration. <laughs> People don't find us. We find them. No one came to this building uninvited. All visitors were called here for one reason or another. Yet there the woman stood in the dim light from the street lamp. An anomaly. The woman was looking right at Victoria, calling out and waving her hands. Victoria couldn't hear her through the glass of the second floor window, but the woman was agitated and trying her best to get Victoria's attention. She kept pointing to herself and then to the building. Yes, yes, I know you want in. This is all very peculiar indeed. Victoria chewed her lip and considered the situation. Like so many of her visitors, she had a choice. Acknowledge the woman or ignore her. Well, I suppose that's really no choice at all. I certainly can't leave her out here in the dark calling for help. Now, that's not exactly true, you know. The building decided to take us elsewhere before I could let her in last time. Well, yes. I suppose I did ponder the situation too long last time. But this time, we'll figure it out. She turned on her heels, and just like the last time the woman had appeared, everything shifted, and the building took her away to help a visitor that had been called. The day had been a busy one, as it always was when a visitor came. The music box tinkled for Victoria, lulling her eyelids closed, only to have them pop open when she thought of the mysterious woman from before. The music box continued its tune without disturbance, and Victoria snuggled into her pillow. Sleep crept over her once more, but the mystery would not give up so easily. Who was that woman? The music box never wavered, and eventually, even that mystery couldn't keep her awake, and she drifted off. The sensation was light, like a gentle tap on the shoulder, but it was enough to awaken Victoria. This wasn't the first time she'd been pulled from slumber by this feeling lately, but this time was different. She had a picture in her mind of a dark figure putting something to his lips. She struggled to look more closely and understand who or what it was. The visions were clearer and more detailed each time they came, but she could only see so much before the buzzing in her ears became a painful headache. Victoria sat up and pinched the bridge of her nose against the sensation. Ugh. Oh, it's happening again. Very unpleasant. What's about to follow is very troubling indeed. The pain intensified, and she closed her eyes and winced. Ugh. Then the vision came just as it had the last several times. In this one, she saw a small boy who, like all the others, was near the age she herself had been when she became what she was now. The boy was walking through a doorway into a bright, moonlit clearing, his eyes filled with wonder as he stepped forward, and then the vision was gone. He was gone, and the pain subsided. Oh dear, another one. The nightgown felt strange. She was used to cotton, satin, and silk, but this was something else entirely. It was itchy, and her skin prickled with a million electric ants as she focused on being fully solid. It took a lot of energy and concentration, and Victoria wasn't used to the sensation. She fidgeted and looked down at the image of a smiling cartoon bear on her tummy, who in turn had a rainbow on its tummy. Children wore such odd clothing these days. But she had to admit she liked the character, something called a caring bear, if she remembered correctly. She looked in the full-length mirror at the auburn ringlets and spray of freckles across her nose and cheeks. 
The appearance she had taken on made her look nothing like herself, but whether she could fool him, well, that was yet to be seen. Victoria chewed her lip and looked at the girl on the bed whose virtual twin she had become. Are you sure it will work? Well, that's hardly reassuring. Are you sure you can keep her asleep when he calls to her? The pain came hard and fast this time. It spread from the spot just above her nose and quickly radiated out until Victoria's whole head was throbbing and her eyes watered. <laughs> well, it seems as though we're about to find out. The closet door rattled frantically in its jam and then settled into silence. A bright light throbbed along the edge of the door, alternating from deep crimson to bright amber, and a haunting melody played. The slumbering girl stirred. She kicked off her blanket and sheets and reached out for the door. The music box played louder, doubling down on the lullaby. The air around the box rippled and wavered, and a cello, a viola, and a pair of violins joined the melody. Well, you're full of surprises, aren't you? The closet door swung open, and Victoria cast a longing glance at her music box her constant companion for longer than she cared to think about, and stepped through the doorway. The man leaned forward as he played. His eyes were closed in concentration, but shot open as a surprisingly odd sensation ran down his fingers, and he nearly stopped playing. But that would have shut the portal, so he ignored the feeling and continued to play. It wasn't quite a vibration, and not quite a sting, but a little of both, and really, not quite either. He felt, rather than heard, a tinkling melody, similar to the one he had been playing. But the portal closed, and it was gone. For just a moment, though, he sensed, through his connection to the flute, that it recognized and feared whatever played that tinkling melody. Well... That was strange, was it not, old friend? I've not felt that from you before. What is it? The flute was unusually silent. While it could not, of course, play without him, normally when he asked it a question, it would guide his fingers and respond. This time it said nothing. Of course, he really didn't need its response to know something was off. He felt it too. It wasn't just the music. Something was unique about this child who had crossed into the eternal now. Her energy felt different, somehow. The others sustained him, but this one, she was special. She might be the one he'd been looking for all these years. Perhaps, finally, it could stop. The grass was warm and soft under Victoria's feet. The scent of the trees and blossoms was rich and redolent of summer, and she found it intoxicating. Hard to think. Hard to remember who she was and what she was doing here. The moon was bright and huge. Gleaming white flowers lining a dark stone pathway swayed hypnotically in a gentle breeze, beckoning her to follow it into the forest. She paused for a moment and sighed. It was so lovely here. All she needed to do was follow the pathway, and she was sure magical things awaited. The trees whispered to her on the breeze as the flowers lining the path sang a soft, ethereal melody. Come along, child. Come, Come see, see the, the things, things that wait for you. Everything you ever wished or release. So many things to see. Such tasty treats. So many friends to meet, so many fun games to play. Some part of her was screaming that this wasn't why she was here, that she had a purpose here, something she needed to do, but it was hard to focus with the whispering trees and the soft light of the moon and the scent of the lovely little flowers. Victoria smiled and started down the path through the clearing and into the deep, dark woods. Jeremy huddled in the dark within the small cage. He sat on the rough floor, hugging his knees close to his chest, rocking back and forth. His face was streaked with dried tears, but he no longer had the energy to cry. 
He couldn't recall how long he had been in this place. Time had no meaning in the darkness, but it wasn't at all what the trees had promised. Certainly many other children his age were here. He could make them out in the dim light, all confined as he was in small cages that went on as far as he could see before disappearing into the darkness. He could hear many more caged children than he could see, though, some crying, some whimpering softly, and others calling out for their parents. All Jeremy knew for sure was that there were a lot of them. A new girl walked forward in a daze and stepped into the open cage beside his. She turned and sat down on the hard stone floor as the door to her cage clanged shut. What? Jeremy turned to her and watched as the blank stare fell from her face, and she gasped, and her eyes widened as her head swung back and forth, taking in her prison. This is... The girl frowned and stood. She walked toward the door of her cage and examined it before giving it a rattle. She sighed, then walked to the interior of her confinement, examining the metal bars, before finally kneeling to inspect the bottom of the enclosure. <sighs> Bolted to the ground and quite unmovable. She stood and surveyed the vast space where she and the hundreds of others were held. <gasps> oh dear, this is... This is monstrous. The girl looked at Jeremy and gripped the bars of her cage. Hello. Jeremy stood and did his best to brush the dirt from the knees of his blue plaid pants and smooth out the wrinkles on his stained and threadbare t-shirt, which had been white when he arrived. He walked to the edge of his cage and observed the girl. She was petite, with red hair and freckles, and she wore a nightgown that featured a pink bear with a rainbow on his tummy. He recognized it as the Care Bear, Cheer Bear. His sister had them all over her room when she was younger. Hi. My name is Victoria. What's yours? I'm Jeremy. Do you know where we are? What this place is? Jeremy shook his head. The girl was about the same age as he, but something about the way she spoke and stood made her seem more like a grown-up. That's okay. I'll get this all sorted. Have you been here long? I... I don't know. Sometimes it feels like it's been very long, but other times it seems like I just got here. I can't really explain it. I remember there being another girl in your cage before you. She was already here when I came here, but then one day she just seemed to fade away. I feel like she and I knew each other for a very long time, but also no time at all. It is a very odd place indeed. I can feel something. Strange. About the way time moves here. Do you remember the last time you had food or water? I don't. Now that you say that, it, it's weird. I don't remember eating anything in a long time. But I'm not hungry. Victoria nodded. Did you come here through your closet door? Yes. I remember that. There was music, like like a flute coming from my closet. I opened the door and I was outside. The moon was really big and there were trees and flowers and a forest. The trees told me that there was a special place with lots of friends for me. The rest is kind of foggy. I just remember waking up here. And the rest of the children? Were they here when you got here too? Some were. But others kept showing up. As if on cue... The shuffling of small feet made them both turn and watch as a sandy-haired boy with a dazed look on his face approached and shuffled between their pens before stepping into an empty cage two rows away. Victoria set her jaw and her eyes narrowed. This must stop. I'm getting us all out of here. The man's fingers twitched and he reached for the flute. She's not what she seems. The others, yes, they sustain us. They have the spark that sets them apart. But this one? Oh, I can taste the years upon her. She is unique. Yes, I feel that too. It's familiar. Hmm. Something I can't quite place, but 
As long as she's caged, I think she can do little harm. <laughs> yes, but it's become so hard to find ones with the spark. They are rare indeed anymore. She could be the one we've been looking for. The man took his long coat from a hook. He held it out at arm's length and considered the faded red and yellow fabric for a moment. He had mended it so many times over the years. The patchwork of red and yellow squares followed the same pattern it had when it was new and fine, but he had replaced nearly every one of them at this point. Was it even the same coat? Probably not. But then he wasn't the same man he had been when he washed up on that strange island shore and found the flute. He shook his head and let the memories fall away. He slipped on his coat and moved to the ancient wooden door that was the only exit from the small room where he spent most of his time. The door was connected to so many others, different times, different places, and all he needed to access them was his beloved flute, Auron Nagihe, as the maker had named her. She was but one of the special keys the maker had crafted, but she was his. They'd been together for centuries now, and he couldn't imagine being without her. His fingers brought her to his lips, and the music came. The door shimmered, and light danced around its edges before it opened, and he stepped into the in-between place, the eternal now. The moon shone large in the star-filled sky, diamonds cast on a great black velvet curtain. He strolled along the path, breathing deeply the sense of what looked to any observer to be simply flowers and trees. But like so many other things in this place, they were more than they appeared. They bowed slightly towards him as he passed, and he felt their hunger and their reverence. He kept these creatures fed, and they in turn kept the children docile and bemused as they led them to the great chamber. He rounded a curve in the path, and the cave opening gaped before him. It had been many years since he had entered the vast cavern, but the girl warranted a closer inspection. He needed to be sure she was who and what he suspected. The whimpering died away, and the children fell silent as the piper entered. He always expected them to call out to him, to beg him to release them, to plead with him like those first 130 from Hamlin had, but they were always silent. It was becoming ever harder to find ones who could sustain him. Back when he had taken those first out of spite and anger, it changed him. In those days, nearly every child had the spark. Now, even in the few who did have it, it was barely a glimmer. He pulled them from so many times and places, but there were fewer every year. He stopped in front of her cage and stared at her. She didn't look any different than the others a frail thing with auburn hair and freckles, but the way she stood and set her chin as he approached. Yes, there was fire in this one. She was most certainly more than she seemed. He leaned forward for a closer inspection and rested his hands on his knees. A suspicion began to take hold. He could sense a lingering energy coming from her. The flute's reaction made sense now. He grinned slowly and stood tall. Hello, child. The girl glared at him. Cat got your tongue, young one. <laughs> my cat has many things, but my tongue is not among them. Oh, an angry one, are we? Putting children in cages tends to have that effect on me. Well, I sense you're not used to being confined in such a manner. Well, then, step free. Guy. He watched as some of the fire went out of the girl's face but she continued to glare at him. <laughs> yes, I know who you are, but where is Orana Masego? I can taste her lingering energy on you. How? <laughs> How could you know her? No one knows my music box's true name. I see I have you at a disadvantage in more ways than one. Well then, let's have a good look at you, shall we? The piper brought the flute to his lips and played an ancient Celtic tune, 
something quite similar to some of the songs Victoria's Music Box played when she was otherwise occupied with reading, daydreaming, or falling asleep. Those tunes had always been a source of comfort to her, but hearing one so similar come from the flute of the strange, evil man filled her with dread. She dropped to her knees as a great dizziness overcame her, and her disguise fell away. The piper continued to play, and her dizziness grew. She watched as her arms and hands faded and fluttered. She flickered between the way she normally appeared and the other ancient form she sometimes took, her arms dark and surrounded by a green nimbus of light. When she looked up at the piper, the two brilliant orbs of the green fire reflected back at her from the metal bars of her cage. But that fire slowly ebbed, and she became fully solid, once again just a little girl in a purple dress with lace ruffles. Ah, there you are. He circled her cage, considering her. Quite weak without her, aren't you? Mm. But you are full of time. I can taste it. You've lived so long. The years, they're a jumbled mess within you. You've crossed your own timeline so many times. He played the flute again, a fast, excited tune that started and stopped abruptly. For the first time in a very long time, Victoria was afraid. You've been to other possible when. So many of them. You're going to be absolutely delicious. Again came a barrage of notes. A song more beautiful than any Victoria had ever heard. But each note tugged at her. While she remained motionless, something within her was being wrenched free. <laughs> It was as if his melody was playing cat's cradle with the very essence of her. All that she ever had been and ever would be was being twisted, pulled, and anchored to every point in time she had ever visited. A blast of green light exploded outward from her, and she screamed. Victoria writhed as the piper played. Translucent tendrils of dark energy radiated from her in too many directions to count, disappearing into the darkness of the cavern. They pulsed with energy and flowed through the girl to the piper. Stop it! You're hurting her! The piper ignored Jeremy's pleas and continued to play. His eyes closed as he absorbed the energy. Yes, ah, you're connected to so many winds, so many possible futures. I've never felt anything like this. Delicious. Please, no. You have to stop. The piper played on as if Jeremy hadn't spoken. Jeremy looked around for something he could throw at the evil man, and his eyes fell upon a large black rock about the size of a baseball, that glittered wetly outside his cage. He dropped to his hands and knees and reached for it, but his fingers fell a marble's width away. He twisted and stretched, reaching farther, but his fingertips only slid along the watery surface. He grunted and pressed harder against the metal bars, his face stretching tight between them. If only his head fit through, but then he would have escaped long ago. Turning his head away would give him a better angle, but then he couldn't see. Victoria's moaning cry prompted him to turn his head and press so hard against the cage he hoped his ear wouldn't rip off. Only bare, gritty earth met his hand, so he adjusted and brought it down again. More rough dirt. It would be easier to sweep back and forth, but that could send the rock out of reach. One more time, he raised his arm, picturing the rock and where it should be. His hand came down on its hard, damp surface, and he squeezed his fingers to grip it and pull it in. Clenching it, he stood. He tested the weight, took aim, wound up, and threw. 
No! What have you done, you wicked child? Our on, okay? Where are you? Oh, I can feel it. You're in pain. Hold on, my love. I'll find you. The piper dropped to his knees and began pawing around the cave floor for his flute. I swear, child, if you've harmed her, there will be no end to your torment. We'll tear every last bit of energy from your useless husk and leave you lingering on the brink of death for all eternity. Ah, there you are. The man cradled the flute in his hands, slowly and carefully searching for the damage he too felt. No! You've cracked her! She's wounded! You've... The piper glared at Jeremy, then rushed toward him grabbing for him through the bars of Jeremy's enclosure. But Jeremy was small and quick. He jumped out of the man's reach. I'll be back to deal with you once I tend to my dear fruit. Use that time to contemplate how horrible your torment will be when we return. Jeremy shivered as the evil man exited the cave, then turned his attention back to the girl, who laid crumpled and motionless. The piper hunched over his workbench, examining the chips and cracks of the boy's ruthless attack under a magnifying glass. He cared for the flute lovingly over the centuries, keeping her clean, fixing scratches and cracks with resins and shavings of wood taken from scraps the maker had left behind in his workshop. Precious little of this wood remained, and never had he tried to repair damage so severe. The flute was ancient and the impact of the rock and subsequent fall cracked her nearly a quarter of her length. Small splinters jutted out, and at least one fragment had broken away. Oh, dear one, I'm so sorry you've been wounded so. I will make you whole again. And then, then we will make the Drochlanov pay for what he's done. The piper wondered if he could indeed make her whole once more or if the damage was simply too severe. For her to sing again, he must preserve as much of her original wood as possible. Every stroke the maker had made when he carved her had purpose, and any change might mean she'd never speak the same way again. He sighed deeply and set to work, using delicate tools and what little remained of special glues and resins that only the maker had known how to formulate. Victoria stirred. She was cold, and the hard ground hurt her hip and shoulder. She wasn't used to these sensations. She brought her hands up and was shocked by the sight of scrapes and dried blood. Despite the pain and confusion, she had the odd sense of elation when she realized she was fully solid and human. She took a deep breath and sat up. Are you okay? Victoria looked at her dress, which was muddy and torn in a few spots. Tendrils of energy, too many to count, flowed out of her, writhing and pulsing. They stretched into the darkness. She passed her hand through them experimentally. They had no substance, but she felt a faint tingle as her hand moved through them. Victoria stood and grabbed a bar of her cage as a wave of dizziness and disorientation overtook her. The piper... Where is he? He's gone off somewhere. I threw a rock at him and his flute. I think it might have broken. You did what? I threw a rock at him to make him stop hurting you. I appreciate the help, but I'm not certain that was wise. If you've broken his flute or damaged it, you've made a dangerous enemy. Who is he? He's the Piper of Hamlin. Who? You've heard of the Pied Piper. Most children have. The one who led the rats away with his flute. (laughs) That's just a story. Most stories are based on some truth. In this case, the reality is far worse than the tale. His flute isn't just a flute. It looks like a flute, and it plays like a flute, but it's something much more powerful. I don't get it. It's quite a long story. And while I do absolutely love telling stories, I feel too drained and exhausted to tell them properly. The important part is, the same craftsman who made his flute also made my music box. 
Hmm. My music box has told me about her sisters before. We've even met one of them owned by a man named Boba Soro. This one. The flute is named Windsong. She can open doorways to other places and times. And lure those who hear her voice. She's also quite mad. But what... What is a flute mad about? <laughs> Not mad angry. Mad insane. Like the Mad Hatter from Alice in Wonderland. But in a much more dangerous way. So what do we do? Can you use your music box to get us out of here? No, I came here without her. I had to leave her behind to protect the little girl whose place I took. There is a way to get you all home though. I know there is. There must be. I wish there was. Victoria surveyed the cavern and looked at the children. There were so many of them, lost, confused, ripped from their parents and families and tossed in cages. They were from so many places, so many different times, all pulled together into this horrible place by a man who didn't care at all about them, aside from them being a source of nourishment. These creatures will have to be dealt with too eventually. Creatures? Those horrible things that look like trees and flowers, lining the parts of the cave. Oh. They make the Piper's evil possible, supporting him, keeping us and the other children docile, whispering to us to lead us to this awful cave. I understand what they are now, but that's a separate matter. The priority now is getting you all home where you belong. Without her music box, though, that would be no simple task. She looked at the tendrils attached to herself, watching as pulses of energy flowed into her. <gasps> it dawned on her what these strange ethereal tendrils were. Victoria studied Jeremy. Yes, she had initially missed the razor-thin and nearly transparent tendril that ran from the top of his head into the vast darkness. And the other children had them, too. Every one of them. But... Unlike the children, who were only connected to one time, one place, and one possible future, she was connected to many. Every time she used her lift to cross into another time, place, or possible reality, she left an impression there, a connection back to her original timeline. So that's what he's doing. He's feeding on us, all of us. He's drawing life force from our possible future. I know how to get you out of here, Jeremy. I can send you all home. That is, of course, as long as the flute still works. The Piper moved quickly, his footsteps falling swiftly along the pathway on his way back to the cave. He would make the boy pay for what he had done. But first, he would feed and share what he collected from the special girl with the flute to repair the rest of the damage. The trees and flowers leaned close as he passed, their hunger palpable. Soon, friends. Soon you'll have more to feast on than you ever imagined. He played. Even before he entered the cavern this time, his fingers coaxing the song from Auran Nagihe. Her voice hesitated ever so slightly, and her song had a near imperceptible difference that he alone could discern. He played faster, determined to fix her, to make her whole again. The mouth of the cave yawned wide as he rounded the final curve in the path, and he stepped inside without pause, the shadows falling upon him. The children pressed to the backs of their cages as he moved deeper into the grotto and toward the pen that held the guide. He's coming. Be calm. He's coming for me first. The song of the flute grew louder. Victoria moved to the door of her prison and waited for the piper to appear. She took a deep breath to settle the fear rising within her. It wasn't an emotion she had felt often over the last few centuries, and she wrestled to control it. Easy. You can do this. Deep breaths. I can do this. The piper stopped in front of her cage and stared at her for a few moments. We're not afraid of you. The piper narrowed his eyes, but didn't turn. That is most unwise, boy. But 
I'll deal with you soon enough. Right now, I have some unfinished business with Miss Victoria. Isn't that right, lass? If this is my fate, then so be it. Today, this will end, one way or another. As I have endeavoured to tell so many others throughout the years, we are the choices we make. I choose to stand against you, and all that you represent. The world would be better without you wielding the power you hold. So I will take it from you. <laughs> That's cute. Okay, here we go. The piper played. But Victoria was ready this time. Electric fire burned across her flesh. Thousands of tiny tendrils drilled into her and pulled the energy from every moment of her long life. Victoria closed her eyes against the torment and let it come. The energy in her built faster than the piper could drain it. She was inside her every moment, and each one burned within her until she was green fire. The pain burned away, and she was finally in control. She was her past, and she was her future. She was every choice she made, and every choice she helped others to make. She was alive, and she was the void. Inside it all were a thousand fragmented notes from a thousand points in time. Each moment flowed to her, bringing with it a single note from her music box. Every time her music box played an extra, out-of-place note, she assumed it was an errant ping due to the age of her dear companion. But as time fell away, she understood each note was a deliberate choice. Together, the thousands of wayward notes became a symphony. The piper's flute fell silent. What are you doing? What is that song? Oh no, don't stop now. Here, let me help you play. Victoria pulled on the connection the piper had created between them and guided his fingers making the flute sing the same song as her music box. The flute really wasn't so different from her music box, immensely powerful, but unlike her music box, this key was twisted and not at all sane. She spoke to it. She reasoned with it. Victoria was no stranger to madness. Her own mother, so many of her visitors, the Tin Heart. Somewhere within its darkness, she found the spark of what it once was, and they connected, then came to an agreement. The melody changed. Victoria's own scattered moments of time brushed up against those of the caged children and overlapped them. As they did, the children vanished one by one. Each child returned to the moment when they had been stolen, all their possibilities restored, until only Jeremy remained. She turned to him and smiled. Be safe. I have a special future waiting for you. Goodbye. Wait, what about you? And then he was gone, safe in his bed, where he belonged. With all the children home, she turned her attention back to the piper and his mad flute. I'm afraid you're too dangerous to be allowed to remain together. No, no, I refuse to let you take her from me. You may think you've won, but you haven't. The piper managed to wrestle control away from the girl in that final moment and play nine notes. But nine notes were enough. The flute flew apart, exploding in every direction and tossing Victoria head over heels into the bars of her cage. Four years later... September 24th, 1989. The diner buzzed with early Sunday morning energy. Special Agent Jackie Ellis sat with her friend Tom Riley in a booth along the back wall, watching the entrance. She looked at her wristwatch and sighed. <sighs> They'll be here. It's almost 11 o'clock. They'll be here. Are you sure the information is good? It's always been good. You sure you can trust... What's her name? Renee. 
Yeah, I'm sure. She's the one that had the trouble with that boxer. Jackie, you know for this arrangement of ours to work, there are things you don't want me to talk about. (sighs) Right. So she's been gone for four years. Why all of a sudden does she show up now? I doubt it was by her choice. You know time isn't always the same for her as it is for us. It might have been a few days, a month, even... Or four years. Or four years, yeah. Probably has been four years. I don't know, maybe he's been good at moving them around. We've had everyone looking. And I mean everyone. There are a lot of you, aren't there? You know better than anyone there are. And we'd do anything for her. And we're sure it's her. Renee is. They come here every other Sunday. He orders corned beef and hash, and she gets blueberry pancakes. There is one weird thing, though. Or so Renee says. What? It's... It it doesn't make sense. Not with what I know about how long she's been in the building. Never mind. We'll see when they come in. Don't play me like that, Tom. If you know something... You two want more coffee. Perfect timing. I was just thinking about a refill. I'll bet you were. Are you, miss? Yeah, do it. The coffee's really good here. We do our best. You sure you two don't want to order anything? People love our blueberry pancakes. So I've heard. Tom and Jackie looked up and watched the girl make her way to the coat rack. She removed her bright yellow jacket to reveal a faded and worn lilac sweater and hung her jacket on a hook. As the girl turned back to take a seat at a table near the window, they got a good look at her. She was in her early teens and wore her curly blonde hair in a short bob. Her pink sunrise capri were faded, and one knee was worn through. Oh. My. God. That can't be her. Yeah. See, that's what Renee told me. I guess it makes sense. What? How old does she look to you? Thirteen, fourteen, maybe. But that's not possible, is it? I mean, it can't be her. She's always been the same. If she was gone for four years, and she's been outside of the building... This can't be right. The bell rang again, and an older man in his 70s wearing large, dark-rimmed glasses entered. He skipped the coat rack and kept his tweed coat and Irish flat cap as he joined the girl at her table, who was already excitedly putting in her order with the waitress. It's him. How can you tell? I just can. We need to separate them so we can talk to her. We need to be sure. You brought it? What do you think's in this bag? Uh, Take it easy. I just wanted to be sure. She's looking at us. Maybe that's a good sign. Now he's looking at us. You've been staring. Maybe they think you're a creep. Maybe he thinks you're a cop. Please. I don't give off cop vibes. I know how to be discreet. (laughs) Oh, you're funny. You totally give off cop vibes. People will know for sure when I shoot your ass. The man stood and walked in their direction. He's coming. Just play it cool. The man slowed as he approached and stopped at their booth. He looked intently at Tom, then Jackie. Well, hello there, sir, miss, and what a fine day it is indeed. (laughs) The man tipped his hat at each of them in turn and then walked on. Okay, so where's he going? Men's room. Let's do this. Right. The two made their way to the booth, where the young blonde girl sat arranging syrup and napkins as she waited for her meal. She looked up as they approached. Hi there. Hello. I saw you looking at us. May I help you? I'm Jackie Ellis with the FBI. We're trying to find a lost girl, and we were hoping you might be able to help us. Is it okay if we ask you a few questions? May I see your badge? (laughs) Sure. Here you go. Hmm. Looks real. And I assume that your friend here is not with the FBI, since neither of you identified him as such. Smart kid. No, I'm not FBI. I'm just a concerned citizen. Helping out. 
I guess you'd call me a, um, consultant. The girl considered Tom, blinking a few times and looking him over. I'd say that's not entirely accurate, but you seem to be okay. Do I, um, do I look familiar to you at all? No. Should you? You just remind me of someone. I might be mistaken. Perhaps. So, you come to this diner pretty often? Of course. My pop-pop brings me here for pancakes all the time. I hear they're pretty good. Oh, indeed they are. Blueberry is my favorite, with lots of maple syrup and loads of butter. Well, that sounds good. It is. So, your pop-pop? Yes. You live with him? That's right. Have you lived with him long? Um, a while, I guess. Uh Uh-huh. And I hate to ask this, honey, but what happened to your parents? Oh, I don't have any. Did they pass away? No. But you said you don't have parents. That's right. My pop-pop takes care of me. And is he your mom's dad or your dad's dad? Neither. He's just my pop-pop. But honey, you must have had parents at some point. No. I don't think so. I live with my pop-pop. Here you are, honey. Your blueberry stack. Extra blueberries for my favorite girl. Oh my, they look wonderful. You enjoy, Vicky. Oh, I intend to. And you too. You sure no pancakes for you? No. Thank you, though. Excuse us for a minute, Vic- Vicky. Mm-hmm. Tom and Jackie took a few steps away from the girl as she dug into the plate with great gusto. It's her. I agree. How do you want to do this? Are you carrying? Do you really want me to answer that? Good. You go to the men's room and see what happened to Pop Pop. I'll give her the box. Got it. And Tom. Yeah? You know he can't get near the box. I know. If you have to, you do what you need to do. Right. Tom's laid-back attitude fell away. He straightened to his full height and adjusted his jacket, then moved with purpose toward the rear of the restaurant. Jackie watched him disappear around the corner, then returned to the table and slid into the chair across from the girl. So, the pancake's good? Mmm. Mm-hmm. Really good. That's good. I'd like to have you take a look at something for me, okay? Mm-hmm. Jackie pulled a small wooden box out of a brown leather satchel and pushed it across the table toward the girl. So this. This is something that belonged to our missing girl. It's very special. It's very pretty. Yes. (laughs) Very old, too. It has a strange design on the top. That's called Yggdrasil. It's a special tree. And the little owl here. Is that a clasp? Yes, It's a music box. May I open it? Absolutely. In fact, I bet it will play a special song for you. The girl reached for the box as Tom returned to the table. He's gone. There was a door leading out to the alley right next to the men's. I knew something was up when he said hello to us. He made us and took off. The girl opened the box, and it played... She watched the gears inside spin and sparkle. Then she closed the lid and looked at Tom. Tommy, Tommy boy, Tommykins, tomato. Hey, sweetheart. How long? Four years. Oh. Oh. Hey, it's okay. (laughs) Come here. I've got you. Victoria felt ridiculous as she tried on yet another dress. She looked at her arms jutting out at least nine inches from the end of the sleeves. None of these are going to fit me. I'm going to need a whole new wardrobe. That one seems like it fits better than the first one. But they're all the same size. She examined herself in the mirror. Jackie was right. This one did seem to be larger than the first one she tried on. She tilted her head and looked at her hair. 
What was this morning a curly bob that barely reached her chin was now brushing her shoulders. Now that she was back in the building, she was reverting to her prior state and appearance. <sighs> I thought this might happen. How do you feel about that? I've been perpetually nine years old for nearly a millennium now. Well, at least from my perspective, that is. Although, I'd be fibbing if I didn't say I enjoyed having a chance to be a normal girl for a little while. The last time that happened was an exceptionally long time ago. The last time? It's a long story. It was a gift from my friend Josh. <sighs> but it only lasted a single night. Oh, really? A gift from a boy, you say? It was all very proper, I assure you. <laughs> I'll take your word for it. Come, there's much to be done. They exited her bedroom, with Victoria leading the way, then made their way down the hallway, which always seemed much longer to Jackie than it should have been, until they came to her lift, where Tom waited with a thick file under his arm. Are you sure you want to wear that? This is what I always wear. It's a little small. That would change the longer I'm with my music box and in the building again. This dress already feels a little looser. Besides, I need to know what's been happening while I was gone. I have a file ready for you. News clippings, magazine articles, transcriptions from TV interviews, and more. The world is much as it was, though. Honestly, I was expecting more chaos with you gone for so long. Well... My timeline isn't exactly chronological, as you know. The effects of my time away might not be apparent for 10, 20, 30 years or even longer. Rest assured, though, at some point in the future, we're all in for a very troublesome four years. But I'm back now, and there will be hope. Victoria took the file and opened it. She looked at the first page, a transcription from an interview, and read... Maybe hate is what we need if we're going to get something done. Who talks like that? Oh, I'll be keeping an eye on this one. She closed the file and walked to her lift, and the doors immediately opened. The three stepped inside, and Victoria pressed the button marked 9. As the elevator moved... Victoria turned to Jackie. You seem very familiar to me. Have we met before today? Not for a lack of trying, but no. I've met you, but you haven't met me yet. Well, before today, that is. That sounds about right, but I'm sure I've seen you somewhere before. Are you sure you haven't tried to meet me before the proper time? Guilty. I tried to warn you before this all started, tried to keep you from getting trapped by that son of a bitch, but your building wasn't having it. Yes, things must happen at their appointed time, and for very good reason. It's a lesson I've had to learn myself the hard way. The lift came to a stop, and the door opened. Tom and Jackie stepped out, but Victoria remained inside. Tom looked at her with a raised eyebrow as she handed him the file. Go on, we'll meet in the library shortly. But first, I have something to take care of. May 26th, 2007. Victoria stepped from her lift into the darkness of the pet rescue shelter. It was 5 a.m., so the volunteers hadn't arrived yet. A few dogs whimpered as she walked by, but fell silent when they saw the huge shape that walked beside her. Its powerful muscles rippled under its gray fur, and the thick curls of its mane swayed as it moved. It looked every bit like the traditional statues that guarded sacred temples. I appreciate you taking on this task, Victoria told the Kamayanu, who blinked and gave a single nod in acknowledgement. Jeremy is particularly important to me. He helped me at one of my darkest moments. Saved my life, in fact. But... He made a powerful enemy in the process. It's only a matter of time until he has family of his own. I need to know they'll all be safe, and the Piper can never harm them. The food dog again blinked and nodded his huge head. Ah, here we are. 
The two came to a litter of tiny Shih Tzu puffs. Are you ready? The lion dog gave a single nod, and the star of Buddha on his forehead glowed. He shrank slowly, becoming smaller and smaller, while his features changed as well. Finally, he was the same size, and had the same markings as the tiny pups. Victoria gathered him up and kissed his forehead before placing him with the others. He raised his paws and wrapped them around her wrist, then snuggled down with his new litter mates to wait for Jeremy to arrive and take him home. Thank you for listening to today's story, Von Homlin. Today's author was Daniel Foytek. That's me. Today's story was told by Graham Rowett and starred Pierce O'Byrne, Amber Collins, Erica Sanderson, me, Francisca Moe, and Cynthia Lohman. Our resident composer and executive producer is Nico Vitese of We Talk of Dreams. Artwork for today's episode was created by Jeanette Andromeda, our art director and executive producer. Our producer is Meg Williams. Our showrunner and producer is me. If you enjoyed today's tale, check out more of Victoria's adventures. Subscribe to Victoria's Lift and Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Visit victoriaslift.com to find out more about the cast and crew. Wicked Library is created by Ninth Story Studios, LLC. All rights reserved. <laughs>